Our last but not least speaker, <laughs> Jacob Lurie of the IAS, who's going to tell us about rationalized symptomic cohomology. All right. Uh, thank you very much. So throughout this lecture, P is a fixed prime number, or I guess for this whole year, P has been a <laughs> prime number. And everything is going to be P complete. And if I don't mention it, I probably. If there's ever a question whether or not I meant to assume this, the answer is yes. So I'm going to be talking about the theory of syntonic cohomology. So let X be a p-adic formal scheme. And you can associate to X the variants called its symptomic cohomology groups, which I'll write as uh, H star sin X comma Z of N. And these are the cohomology groups. Some chain complex, which I'm just going to write as R gamma X Z of N. And this uh, invariant has a long history. Uh, the idea goes back at least to the work of Fontaine and Messing in the 1980s. But the definition that I want to talk about uh, is a definition that's that's much more recent. It comes out of the work of uh, Bob Morrow Schulze on integral piatic Hodge theory. So um, maybe I should. So what is symptomic cohomology? And well, one answer is. Um, this complex R gamma of X Z of N is some associated graded piece of the topological cyclic homology of X with respect to a certain um, filtration, which was introduced by Bottom or Schultz. So this is a Definition that makes it clear that symptomic cohomology is something that's closely related to algebraic case. Um, a more recent definition uh, is uh, R gamma X Z of N is the, uh, the fixed points. I'm being uh, divided for Banius, some kind of divided for Banius operator. On prismatic homology introduced by Otten Schulze. Um, but the definition that's going to be closest in spirit to what I'm discussing in this talk is a point of view due to Drinfeld that this R gamma of X Z of N symptomic homology groups are the, the coherent homology. of a certain auxiliary geometric object um, which I'm going to follow the notation from Bargov's course on this last year I'll denote by x sin so this is some uh, stack on the category of commutative rings and the symptomic cohomology of x is the coherent cohomology of this with the uh, coefficients in a certain line bundle I'll call that and is the weight that you're interested in. And so now, having promised that everything in this talk is going to be p-complete, I'm going to immediately violate that convention by saying that this talk is going to be about what happens when you rationalize this. So I'll write R gamma X. <laughs> Maybe I should have said QP. Right, there shouldn't have been a P there. QP then. And by that, I just mean take R gamma of X, C P of N, and invert P. So uh, now concerning which category of X you use, so yeah. is it a classical complete formal scheme or maybe you allow derived complete or even derived it's, um, formal scheme or which kind you of- know, you, you, can, you can do this with, with derived formal schemes if you want, you know, for the, you can take X to be smooth and proper over ZP and everything that I'm going to say is still interesting. So if, uh, you know, 
For all technical questions, assume that. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you, you don't need any, I'm, I'm going to make a point about this later. Okay, so the, the question is, what is this? So let me first answer this in a, in a simple case. So suppose, um, now I, an example of a p-adic formal scheme is a scheme which lives over fp. So let x be uh, x0 is some, say, smooth and proper, FP scheme. And I have in mind, I'm calling it X0 now because I have in mind that it's really the special fiber of the object that I really want to study. But it's another example of something that you can study the symptomic polymology of. And this is a more classical invariant. So R gamma of X0 QP of N. This is obtained from the, the, the crystalline polymology of X. Can we write this as? R Chris of X over ZP. So this is a complex of ZP toggles. You can then invert P. And it has an endomorphism called the, the Frobenius, well, just induced by the Frobenius endomorphism of X0. And then you can look at the fiber of the Frobenius minus P to the N, which I'll denote by this superscript here. And that's what symptomic homology is. Um, is computing in this case, just the part of crystalline cohomology on which the Frobenius acts by multiplication by P to the N. Now, the theorem that I want to talk about is, you know, what is symptomic cohomology more generally or rationally? So this is a theorem by, um, Two of the organizers of this seminar, or two organizers of this seminar, and some other guys. We organized it. Matthew organized it in the fall. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> organizers of this seminar and Thomas Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> X is now any chaotic form of scheme. Well, I want to allow any chaotic formal scheme in the classical sense. Maybe I should say the P torsion is annihilated by a fixed power of P. Anyways, have in mind something smooth over ZP. And so then the question is the question that this theorem answers is. What is symptomic cohomology in terms of more classical invariants? So what is this complex R gamma of X um, uh, given? Well, let me write X zero for the special fiber, as I indicated earlier. So whatever this is, this maps R gamma of X zero with QP coefficients. But that's a, a very classical thing. That's just the Frobenius fixed part of crystalline cohomology. Gamma Chris, X multiple ZP, invert P by PPN. There's another thing that it maps to, which is, well, it maps to the Durham cohomology of X, which I'll put here. Uh, cohomology of X with coefficients in its Durham complex, but it maps into something more refined than that. You don't need the entire Durham complex. You just need the uh, the nth stage of the Hodge filtration. So R gamma of X. Um, let me write that as omega X. When we look at differential forms of degree greater than or equal to n. Um, but there's a compatibility between these two maps, which is um, you can think of the crystalline cohomology of the special fiber as the Durham cohomology of X. And in those terms, this diagram should commute. Um, what about uh, X? Is it X is smooth? Or? Let's say X is smooth over, over ZP. Otherwise, well, I'll say something in one second. Okay, so there's a, a diagram like this, and the theorem is that this is a 
Oh, sorry. Every, I need to invert P here. So if X was a scheme that was smooth and proper over ZP, this would be the Durham cohomology of the generic fiber and its um, and some stage of its Hodge filtration. And the theorem is that this is a pullback square. Um, so, so here I've sort of implicitly assumed that X is uh, at least smooth over ZP when I start talking about differential forms, but properly interpreted, this needs essentially no assumptions on X. If X is singular, well, you should use some derived version of the Durham complex and some derived version of crystalline cohomology. And the statement is still true. And I'll give an example in a, one second where that statement is, is also interesting. So let me just make a, a couple of comments about how you can think about this. Wait, sorry. Yeah. Technical question. If yeah. X is really complicated, uh, B and C are not the same. So X is really complicated. What, sorry, what do you have in mind for really complicated? Again, oh, sorry, you, you, sorry, you, you, we only want to contemplate X in when X has okay. some reasonable problem. Yeah. I'm going to use, I'm not really going to ever use X in in this talk. I'm going to use, you know, the base set. But X doesn't have to be physical. Right? X doesn't, well, it will be clear in a minute that that doesn't matter for any of these. That this is true for such a uniform reason that uh, once you know it, um, quasi-compactness is not going to create any problems. Okay, so all right, a few comments about this. So one is um, my understanding of the original definition of symptomic cohomology, this sort of Fontaine messing point of view, is that something like this is almost true by definition, that they, they essentially wanted to design a cohomology theory that had to do with the nth step of the Hodge filtration and being fixed by some Frobenius operator. Uh, so from that point of view, maybe this is a tautology, but then the question or the content is, if you make this the definition of the upper left-hand corner, why is that a useful invariant? What is it? Does, does it have um, useful information about X relating to, does it usefully relate to other invariants of X, like algebraic cycles or algebraic K theory or something like that? So the, the definition of BMS2 of this symptomic complex, it's sort of tautologically related to algebraic K theory. And then it's no longer obvious that it, um, it satisfies this condition. Then, then this statement has some content. Um, so is it clear that you replace QP by ZP is true or? No, it's not true when you replace QP by ZP. I'll, I'll come, we'll get there. We'll also say, this is, there's some earlier work, which is closely related to this, of, um, well, I know, carrots and then, Valenson has another version. Um, where they, they prove something very much like this. So let, let me uh, describe another way of thinking about what this is saying. So here I really want to assume X is something. Let's assume that X is now comes from a scheme, which is smooth and proper over ZP. So another way that you can think about symptomic cohomology in that case is that you take the motivic cohomology of X and you periodically complete it and force it to satisfy a tall descent. So from that point of view, the upper left-hand corner is something that has some relationship to algebraic cycles. And the map from the upper left to the lower right is something like a cycle class map. It's something that takes things related to algebraic cycles and assigns cohomology classes in Durham cohomology. And so you can think about this theorem as a partial answer to the question, you know, given a class in Durham cohomology, when can it come from an algebraic cycle? Well, there's two conditions that obviously would need to be satisfied. There's a sort of condition that appears in the Hodge conjecture, which is that for a cohomology class to come from a cycle, it has to be in cycle of codimension n, it has to be in stage n of the Hodge filtration. 
And there's also a condition that, that sort of comes from the Tate conjecture. If you have a class that comes from an algebraic cycle, then when you think about the target as the crystalline cohomology of the special fiber, it has to be fixed by, or the Frobenius has to act on it by P to the N. And so this theorem is some kind of a weak converse to that. It's saying, if you have a class in Durham cohomology, which the Frobenius acts in the appropriate way and it belongs to the appropriate stage of the Hodge filtration, well, you don't necessarily get an algebraic cycle. You get a class in symptomic cohomology. And what that means if you unfold it a little bit is, well, if you multiply it by a large power of P, then modulo any larger power P, you can get it to come from an algebraic cycle atoll locally, some statement of that flavor. So that's one way that you can think about what this theorem is saying in the case where, um, where X is smooth over zero. So let me just do a, a couple of other examples. So one is, this is interesting even when X is a point. So let's say X is spoof CP. And let me assume N is greater than or equal to two. And in that case, um, this R gamma of X, QP of N, has a concrete description in terms of Galois cohomology. This is just, um, well, It's just the atoll cohomology of the generic fiber. Um, now, what about the rest? So, if n is not zero, there are no Frobenius fixed point or phi phi x by the identity on the crystalline cohomology of uh, the special fiber. So this would just be zero, and the Hodge filtration everything is concentrated in degree zero. So if n is positive, this term is also zero. And well, the Durham cohomology of the generic fiber is just QP. So the lower corner is QP. These are both zero. And that tells you that this thing looks like QP up to a cohomological shift. So concretely, what that's saying is that the Galois cohomology um, of the field QP with QP of n coefficients is just a um, copy of QP if star is equal to one and zero otherwise. And you even get a canonical isomorphism here. Um, another interesting special case was- uh, About n equals zero, this does not- Yeah, n is greater than or equal to two oh, for this yeah. statement to be true. Yeah. n is zero or one, this is definitely not true. Okay, so uh, another example, which was pointed out by, to me by Lars the other day, and now I wanna take something that's very much not smooth over ZP. I wanna take X to be something like uh, the formal spectrum of OC. So I've sort of sold this theorem to you is it's a, a way of computing symptomic cohomology in terms of more familiar invariants. But in this example, you can kind of read it the other way. When X is the formal spectrum of OC, the symptomic cohomology of X is something very simple. It's just a one dimensional vector space um, on a generator that I'll call P to the N if we're in weight N. And well, this maps to, um, you look at the, the crystalline cohomology of the special fiber. That's also something in a single cohomological degree, but it's the ring B Chris. And then you take um, the part of B Chris where phi acts by P to the N. And then, well, B Chris plus B plus Chris. B Chris plus, right? Sorry? B Chris plus. B Chris plus, ah, sorry. So this maps to the uh, crystalline cohomology without that Frobenius condition, which is B Chris plus. And then here we have the nth stage of some filtration on B Chris plus. 
But now a question that you can ask once you leave the realm of things that are smooth over ZP, when I talk about Durand cohomology, did you want to complete with respect to the Hodge filtration? And the answer is it doesn't matter because Durand cohomology is appearing twice. So if you completed with respect to the Hodge filtration on both sides, you would make the same, uh, those uh, modifications would cancel each other out. But let's do that here. So if you complete this with respect to its Hodge filtration, you'll get the ring V Durand plus, and here you'll get T to the N times V Durand plus. And so the statement that this outer square is a pullback it is saying, well, two things. So first, it's saying that you have an exact sequence. Um, QP going to V Chris plus I equals P to the N going to V Durand plus mod T to the N. This is given by multiplication by T to the N, which is the fundamental exact sequence of Piatic Hodge theory, or maybe it's called that when N is equal to one. Um, and second, it's saying you know, here a priori this, uh, when I said phi equals p to the n, I was taking a fiber in the derived category, right? So this is not necessarily obviously in uh, two degrees, sorry, in one degree, but the fact that this is a pullback square is telling you that you have a fiber sequence, which implies that this is in a single degree, which means that phi minus p to the n as a map from b, b plus plus to itself is surjective. Okay, um, so the rest of this lecture, I want to spend uh, sketching for you a proof of this theorem, which I think is very different in spirit than the existing proofs. So um, both the proof of this theorem and the earlier incarnations that I mentioned, um, I really use the connection to K-theory. They're um, I want to give a proof that doesn't have that flavor. It really uh, is something that you, you could understand from a purely algebraic point of view without knowing what a spectrum is. Okay, any questions? Okay, so the first thing I want to do is slightly change the context of this theorem. Well, I want to take X, I'm going to add a P fruit of unity to the story. So now I'm going to let X prime be a um, chaotic formal scheme. Now over ZP, I join a P fruit of unity. And now I'm going to let X zero be its special fiber, but now taking into account that I'm over this phase. So this is X, uh, the closed subscheme where I set my p through of unity equal to one. And now again, we have a x, x prime. Oh, uh, sorry, x prime, yeah. And now we can write something like this again. Um, so here I could put the symptomic complex of x. Now let me write it integrally. That's something which certainly maps to our gamma of x naught. ZP of n, and this maps, uh, well, I'll sort of implicitly assume that X prime was smooth in the notation. So this maps to R gamma of X prime with coefficients in now, now I wanna go to the Durham cohomology of X prime relative to the base that I'm working over. It lands in the nth stage of the Hodge filtration and both of these things map to R gamma of X prime, um, mega of X prime over the base. And here now I'm, I'm using something slightly different from what I used before. Um, this map exists because the maximal ideal in this ring is an ideal with divided powers, which means that I can compute this Durham cohomology also has the crystalline cohomology of the special fiber. Um, and the theorem is 
famous before. Well, let me just. So this is, well, it's now not a pullback square on the nose. This is a pullback square up to isogeny. By which I mean that the total fiber is killed by a fixed power of e. So e to the capital N for N very large. Well, I can tell you how large it needs to be. Um, and then this capital N, it depends only on little n. Um, so in particular, all questions about what do you mean by QP coefficients when you're not quasi-compact, those are not relevant. The, even, there's an even better statement I can make here, which is that the total fiber promotes to a complex of Z mod P to the N modulus in a functorial way, and that would just survive taking any kind of inverse limits that you wanted to take. So possible to N equal to zero for special cases? What's that? Capital A equal to zero if N very small. No, 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 no. no. Well, sorry. If little n equals zero, <laughs> capital N can be zero. I'll, I'll comment about this in a minute. So there, there is something special that happens in the Fontaine and Lafay range yeah. um, when you're over z. Yeah. That now I'm giving a different proof that where the first maneuver is to add a p through to unity, and all of that extra integral information will be lost by this maneuver. Okay. So. I'm sorry, could you repeat what you said about the total fiber is, can be represented by a factorial complex? Yeah, so I'm, I'm telling you, um, you know, if you took the total fiber, it's annihilated by p to the n for n large. It's even better than that. You could like compute it by a complex of z mod p to the n modules that you could build functorially in x. So, you know, if you wanted to take a really big x and you knew the theorem for small x's, then you would conclude. So here we can think about the kind of x in small formal scale, but if it is not exactly, so it, what is the formalism of derived the RAM complex that you are using? Do you like text a simplicial resolution by small thing, and what happens if they are infinite dimensional small things like polynomials in infinitely many variables? I mean, for derived the RAM cohomology, you can, yes, you can resolve the coordinate rings by smooth rings, take the usual cohomology of those, and once you p-adically complete, that's a sensible thing to do. And everything in this lecture is p-adically complete. From now on. No, from the beginning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It was still true. What's that? It was still true. Oh, it was true even when they were rationally very silly. Yes. Okay, yeah. I could say something later about how capital N depends on little n. Yeah, I'll say I'll say something right now. So the proof, the bound that you get from this proof is uh, capital N is little n times p over p minus one plus one, where the plus one is going to be explained in just one moment. Okay, so I would like to make a refinement of this, formulate a refinement of this theorem, actually. So what's going on in this diagram? Um, is zero, you don't get a... Uh, <laughs> no, is zero, you should get... And is equal to zero, you can also eliminate the one. <laughs> okay, let, let, let me talk about this one. I'm going to make a slight modification of what this statement is saying. Um, so what's going on here? So, the, so this is roughly, you take the crystalline cohomology of the special fiber and you look at the Frobenius fixed points. And this vertical map is forgetting that you took the Frobenius fixed points uh, and just landing in the crystalline cohomology of the special fiber. Now, when you think about that crystalline cohomology as the Durand cohomology of X, it has a Hodge filtration. The special fiber doesn't know the Hodge filtration. So, except 
The spatial fiber does know the Hodge filtration mod, mod uh, zeta P minus one, right? Crystalline cohomology, um, well, maybe, the, maybe I should say not crystalline cohomology, but symptomic cohomology, it doesn't, when you map that to the Durham cohomology of the special fiber, it lands in the nth stage. This is the symptomic cohomology of the special fiber. When you map that to the Durham cohomology of the special fiber, it lands again in the nth stage of the Hodge filtration. So let me actually make a slightly refined version of this square that takes that into account. I can replace the target over here. Um, I can take R gamma of the special fiber with coefficients um, in the Durham complex now over FP. It lands in the nth stage of the Hodge filtration and everything maps compatibly to the Durham cohomology of the special fiber where I haven't taken that into account. So apologies for how messy this looks. So now we have a commutative diagram where I've modified the lower right-hand corner in a way that is very innocuous. If I just wanted to make a rational statement, it doesn't matter because these things are both killed by P. So now I'm gonna say this square is a pullback up to multiplication by this number. And that's the form in which I would like to um, to think about the theorem. So let me actually give a name to the object. Let me circle everything that's not the upper left-hand corner and the limit is, um, well, the limit of everything else in this diagram, I'm gonna call R gamma of X, ZP of N split. It's some approximation to the symptomic cohomology of X that you can build from more classical invariants by thinking about the crystalline cohomology of the special fiber and the Durham cohomology and the Hodge filtration and whatnot. And so let me just state the theorem again. So the theorem says that the, um, the map from symptomic cohomology to this thing I'm calling split symptomic cohomology. Um, uh, let's say the, the fiber is rationally trivial. In fact, it's annihilated by P to the N times P, my, P over P minus one. I wish you mean one minus zeta P to the power N P. Sorry, one minus. Um, because p to the one over p minus one is like one minus z. Yeah, yeah, and that well, sort of. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but this is not, not like zp adjoined zeta p linear. That's what is not these complex. Sorry, these are not yeah. right. These are just zp models. Right, right. Yeah. Ah, okay, so it doesn't make sense. What I said doesn't make sense. So maybe oh yeah, I mean, well, it, it still makes sense, right? It's when you base change to when you add a p through to the unity, it's annihilated. Of course. Things. I don't know. It, that's not the way it will enter the proof, but maybe you could rephrase it in a way that that's what. Okay, so it's in the but the integer part actually probably a ceiling rather than a floor. How, what's that? <laughs> we want the exponent to be an integer. So annihilated so by p to the n times n factorial. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other questions about this? Yeah. So usually in these kind of situations is the ramified extensions that really introduce to this. Yeah, so there's a statement which um which does recover uh the sort of good be where you don't base change to ZP Z to P, and then you get something that's more like this. Um, well, sorry, you divide n by p minus one, and uh, there's an analogous statement. 
even if you go you know, to, to widely ramified extensions, I mean, you know, widely ramified extensions. When, you, when I was doing this kind of computations at mm -hmm. some point, uh, yeah, so I'm surprised that you can bound it by uh, number of torsion by number which depends on your name and will not depend on the ramification, which. Well, is, here, you know, X is just being viewed over ZP and P. It might be defined over something bigger that's not being taken into account in the statement. You're comparing to yeah, Durham problem. Yeah, but that's usually where the problem lies. So you, you somehow kill it. So this has nothing to do with the singularities of X prime. The X prime doesn't need to be smooth over any base. Yeah. It's it's that's like it's true for rings like OC. That's but I think both sides will be complicated in that case. If you take something or a ramified extension and you it over the data P. Yeah, this this will be a derived RAM homology now. Yeah. So if you don't add ZP, Zeta P, you said that the if you don't add the zeta p and you form the corresponding diagram. Yeah, so what's the relationship between this theorem and this theorem? So you can recover the original theorem from this theorem by taking the original x, adding a p through to unity to get this diagram, and then taking the fixed points for fp star. That will recover the original diagram. And so if you know that this is a rational pullback square, the original one will be too. Uh, so in some sense, this is more generally more general because you can apply it to things um, that are defined over ZP Z to P that don't come from base, don't come from something defined over ZP. Yeah, but it's it's not true for for the, for the integral synthetic homology. What you said about fixed points, right? So it's not rational. No, no, it's it's a prime to P group. It's an under, uh, sorry, it's a tamely ramified extension. So it's. Okay, so yeah. So any other questions? Ah. In their theorem, there is a slightly better uh, situation happening if A is between zero and the P. Right, so there's there's some statement that you can make in the fontaine lafay range, which, which I'm not talking about in this lecture. I, I, I can tell you, I can ask me afterwards. Okay, so the rest of this lecture is going to be sketching a proof of this. Okay, so now I, I told you the point of view on symptomic cohomology I want to use is Drinfeld's point of view. So now I'm going to ignore the technicality that Bargov mentioned about the ontological status of this object X sim. Right now it's X prime sim. So X prime is something that's defined so wait, sorry, can I? Yeah. About the board you just erased. Yes. What was Zeta P doing? Like I could have drawn the split. I could have talked about the split thing without having Zeta P in the. Yeah, but now the meaning of special fiber has changed, right? Right. I'm setting P equals zero versus Zeta P equals one. No, yeah, but let's say I have something smooth over ZP. I can still talk about this thing. The, some analog of what you would define is our gamma split. Um, yeah, so I, I think, um, I think I don't want to say anything about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so this maps to the syntomification of full spectrum of ZP zeta p, which I'm now in the notation going to ignore the so it maps to some stack by a sum map that I'm going to call pi. And now, so let me now say more formally the thing that I said earlier. Drinfeld's definition, if we used Drinfeld's point of view, this would just be defined as the cohomology of this stack x prime sin with coefficients in a certain line bundle, the nth power of the broy kissin line bundle. And now I want to compute that as r gamma zp sin with coefficients in a certain quasi-coherent sheet. Uh, well, let me call this um, e sub x prime twisted by n, where e sub x prime 
is um, defined to be the push forward of the structure sheaf of X prime uh, And well, all functors are derived. This is all happening in, in derived categories of these uh, stacks. So this is a point of view that you could take that uh, no, the symptomic cohomology of X is the cohomology of a certain quasi-coherent sheaf on this stack ZP zeta P sin. And I want to think of this theorem, uh, I've now erased the theorem, uh, I want to think of this theorem as really a theorem about the geometry of this stack ZP zeta P sin. Right? Here's a formula for symptomic cohomology. I also had this thing that I called split symptomic cohomology. And I would write to, to write down an analogous formula for split symptomic cohomology. And the zeta p disappears? What's that? The zeta p disappears in your formula. Oh, yeah, sorry. Zp zeta p, it's important. Okay, so first, let me maybe make a comment about why this is a useful point of view in the first place. What's the point of this object? What, or what's the point of knowing that the symptomic cohomology of X prime can be computed by a formula like this? And the way that I think about that is that symptomic cohomology, if you just think about it abstractly as a uh, or as cohomology groups, or maybe as a complex that computes those cohomology groups, there's no cuneiform. There's nothing that tells you how to compute the symptomic cohomology of X cross Y in terms of the symptomic cohomology of X and Y individually. And the reason, is that you are taking R gamma over this stack, right? This is a very non-affine object. So you wouldn't expect uh, the operation of taking cohomology over this stack to commute with tensor products. Now, if you think of syntomic cohomology instead as an invariant, which really lands as really the construction which takes X prime to this sheaf, don't take global section. Just think of it as an object uh, as a sheaf on this uh, stack here, then there is a Kunith formula. Um, namely, you know, if I wanted to take E of X cross Y over book Z P zeta P, that just factors as a tensor product of E sub X and E sub Y, that's, of course, the derived tensor product, it's happening in the derived category of this stack. So this is one way to think about it is that um, the points of this stack, every R valued point of this stack gives you a cohomology theory, which is valued in R modules. Namely, take this sheaf um, E sub X and evaluate it at your R valued point to produce a complex of R modules. And each of those um, cohomology theory satisfies a Kunith formula. And symptomic cohomology is somehow made by amalgamating all of those individual cohomology theories, and you lose the Kunith formula. So you put up X and Y over, over what? Over, well, ZP zeta P in this case, because I'm, that's that's where I'm tensoring the sheaves. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is there a link between your Z, ZP uh, zeta P C and the flag containing curve? Because Viesha explained exactly the same kind of structure uh, of the fact for the period of talk. I mean, yes, there is. The, let's ask me afterwards. Well, okay, so let me give an example of that. So one of the things that appears in this statement now erased is that we're interested not only in the symptomic cohomology of X prime, but the symptomic cohomology of its special fiber. So let's see what this Kunith formula tells us about that. So if we wanted to compute R gamma of X naught with ZP of N coefficients, well, X naught is the fiber product of X prime with spec FP. So in the category of quasi-coherent sheaves, we have a Kunith formula like this, which means that this is going to be something that's computed as R gamma over ZP zeta P sin of E sub X tensored with something else, which is E sub spec FP. And then you put whatever twist your 
crisp for whatever weight you're interested in. So more generally, every term in the diagram that we are trying to analyze is something that can be written this way. It's something that's given by taking your um, e sub x prime, which is a sheaf on this stack, tensoring it with some algebra, and then taking global sections, or well, twisting appropriately, and then taking global sections. And so let me just not belabor that point and state the upshot of that. The upshot is that this thing that I called split syntomic homology, the thing that um, is an approximation to syntomic homology that you make by all of these more classical invariants, uh, there's some formula for it that looks like you take the cohomology of this stack ZP zeta P sin with coefficients in something that depends on X tensored with some sheaf of algebras. And this receives a map from the symptomic homology of X, which is just given by the same formula, but there's no A in it. It's the same thing, but here you just took E sub X. And sheaf of algebra is in which sense uh, as I can do algebra naive in degree zero from the right and in which the right sense? Well, so these stacks are sort of completed. So you have trouble talking about what it means to be in degree zero um, for things that are quasi coherent for the same reasons that you do on formal schemes. Yes. Um, if, if you ignore that for a minute, it's a, you should think of it as a, it's not, um, it's not finite, but it's in degree zero and it's some non-flat sheaf of algebras. I'll say this question will be answered in just a moment. I'll tell you exactly what A looks like. So that, that, that's what I want to think of the main theorem as. Okay, so I want to think of this uh, main theorem. Now, it's, it's really something that has nothing to do with X. It's something which is only about the structure of this A, which is essentially a, um, an incarnation of this cohomology theory that I'm calling split symptomic cohomology. So now, here's the theorem about A. A has an increasing exhaustive Filtration, so fill not of A is just the structure sheaf. It was to fill one of A, two of A, and so forth. And I'll tell you what the associated graded looks like. Gur N of A looks like the structure sheaf modulo P times N listed by minus n. Why don't this I actually... This is naive or in a derived sense? What's that? In a naive or a derived sense? What? Almost... I don't know how to distinguish naive and derived. But there is an abelian category in which this lives, yeah. and P is non-zero divisor in that abelian category, so there's no derived notion of mod PM that's different from mod PM. The abelian category is in that abelian category. He, this is torsion free. So what what is the abelian category? Like sheaves on the coherent sheaves on ZP set. So, sorry, ZP zeta P set. So there are no torsion coherent sheaves. Ah, so there are. The structure sheaf is torsion free. So the structure sheaf mod something is coherent sheaf or quasi coherent sheaf. Ah. Well, <laughs> Ger n is O mod something. That's a coherent sheet. <laughs> a is a direct limit of a sequence where each term is coherent. In the limit, it's not coherent. And everything is in degree zero. Well, each individual fill n is in degree zero. When you take the co-limit, it's no longer finite. So maybe it doesn't make sense to ask if it's in degree zero. But if it did make sense, the answer would be yes. 
Okay, any questions about this? So let me, let me just note that if you believe this statement, then you immediately believe the main theorem. So corollary, um, if we're interested in the split um, syntomic cohomology of uh, X prime with ZP of N coefficients, this has a, again, an exhaustive filtration where fill zero is just the usual symptomic cohomology of X. And Ber M is um, R gamma of X prime. Now we're talking about coefficients in Z mod P times N. Well, remember my, maybe I should, write, I'll write that as ZP mod P times. Um, and that's twisted by N minus M. Oh, sorry, P times M. Okay, so now what's the point? The point is that uh, A, on A, this is an infinite filtration. But when you pass to symptomic cohomology, or when you pass to global sections, this is now a finite filtration because the weights here are going down. As soon as M is bigger than N, this is just zero. So only the first N steps of contribute and each of those steps contributes something that's annihilated by P times uh, the name of the step. And as a result, the difference between R gamma and R gamma split is going to be annihilated by P to the N times N factorial. Any questions about this? So like when X is not uh, QCQS, it's not disjoint you know, infinitely many things. Yeah. So apparently the R gamma, all those cis commodities are a product of what happens for the factors. But if, when you take EX tensor, you have some product. I mean, this looks- So I, I don't know if you want, you probably don't want to contemplate E sub X when X is something not quasi-compact, but you have this conclusion when X is quasi-compact and it tells you that it's annihilated by a fixed power of P, which is a statement that survives taking any kind of inverse limit. Okay, so I'm now almost out of time. Um, I wanted to explain to you how you might come to know this about A. Why? So first, this is something very special about A. One way of thinking about this category in which it lives, this category of sheaves on ZP, Zeta, P, Sin, uh, it's some kind of category of p-adic motives. And this theorem is saying in particular that the p-adic motive A is of a very special type. It's like a mixed Tate motive. It's something that you can build um, as an extension of uh, just twists of the structure shift. And the consequence of that is actually, if you know that A has a filtration of this kind, the filtration is uniquely determined. So let me just explain very briefly why that is. So um, if you were interested in, let's say the symptomic cohomology of uh, slope ZP zeta P with ZP of N coefficients, well, we can describe, so these are, these are also the X groups uh, between, uh, Let's say O of K and O of K plus N. If you're interested in X between twists of the structure sheaf, well, the, these X groups can be computed as the cohomology with coefficients in a certain twist of the structure sheaf as just the symptomic cohomology of a point. And what is that? Well, first it's zero. If N is less than zero, which is the point that I really want to use, but let me just mention what it is in other degrees. So if n is greater than or equal to two, this is the same thing as the Galois cohomology of um, the fraction field, QP, theta P, with coefficients in ZP of n. And 
in these other other degrees, it's a little bit different. So in degree zero, what you see is not the cohomology of Galois cohomology. You see the unramified part of that. So it's just the cohomology of the residue field. And in degree one, you see just ZP star, or maybe I should say ZP star, periodically complete uh, ZP adjoins zeta P. Star or rather it's, it's p-adic completion. Um, so if you were to compute Galois cohomology here, you would see something a little bit different. In way one, you would see QP star coming from Coomer theory and some Brouwer group contribution. And the difference between symptomic cohomology and Galois cohomology is that you don't see that Brouwer group and you don't see, um, well, you don't see the, you only see the units in ZP star. Um, but, up to, well, yeah. Well, I'm talking about the cohomology groups. That's in H1, there's nothing in other degrees. Okay, so I just want to note this. Syntomic cohomology is zero if the weight is less than zero. That's something I already applied over here. A consequence of this is that uh, for twists of the structure sheaf, uh, if, you, if you have an extension between two twists of the structure sheet, if the weights are going in the wrong order, then it automatically splits. And if the weights are going in the right order, then the filtration is uniquely determined. So this theorem, it's really a yes, no question whether A has a filtration like this. If A does have a filtration, it's uniquely determined. So this is saying something like A is a, um, like a mixed tape motive. Uh, now, you could ask, how complicated could such a thing be? The easiest thing that could happen was that it would be like a pure tape motive, that it would just uh, split as a sum of its associated graded pieces. Now, that doesn't happen. This is a non-trivial extension between these things. But the extension classes, there's something special to say about those. Those also, in some sense, uh, you know, at the associated graded level, you're seeing only Gawa representations that come from the cyclotomic character, things take twists of the trivial representation. And the extensions between them are also things that you can understand purely in terms of the cyclotomic character. So now, how much time do I have? None. <laughs> um, Can the organizer of the seminar can also allow me to run over a little bit if you like. Wait, wait, where's the other organizer? He's still here. Okay. <laughs> you need to run. I do. All right. I would like to thank the organizers of this seminar for <laughs> doing such a great job of uh, putting this together. Your last selection of speaker was a little dodgy. <laughs> other than that, it was great. <laughs> no. Okay. Now we definitely let you run over a little bit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is the story that's taking place inside the category of quasi coherent sheaves, or what do I call it? The derived category of this stack ZP, Zeta P. Standard. These are what the X groups are between, uh, between the uh, twists of the structure sheaf. And essentially what they look like is the Galois cohomology of QP zeta P. So then, there is a, there's another category, technically a, a stable infinity category, which is related to this, but simpler. So let me call this C. Um, with objects, I'm going to give the, um, the basic objects the same names. So this is generated by objects that I'm going to call O of uh, O twisted by N. And here, what you're going to see is that the X groups between, um, let's say, O of K 
to O of n plus k. They're going to be given by a formula like this, except we're not going to use the Galois group. We're going to use uh, just the cyclotomic one. So this is going to be 0 if n is less than 0. This is just going to be um, zp if n is equal to 0. And otherwise, oh, sorry. For the rest of this talk, p is an odd prime. This is the first place where it's going to matter. Um, so zp if n is equal to 0. And otherwise, what I want to see is the cohomology of um, the target of the cyclotomic character, which I've given myself one p through divinity. So the cyclotomic character takes values in 1 plus p uh, zp. And now with coefficients in zp. Um, so let me just tell you how you might make such a category. So again, because you know the X groups here vanish in negative weight, you know that every object of C, well, every object of C can be built from these twists. And you have a statement like this for every object. Every object is, has a filtration by things that are built from twists of a single weight. Um, and your, also, your other clue for what C should be is that it should have something to do with this profinite group, 1 plus P. Let me call that group gamma. So here's a construction. So C is going to sit inside the category of uh, filtered complexes. with a gamma action such that gamma acts on for n by the nth power of the identity. And n is uh, non-negative? Uh, no, n doesn't have to be non-negative here. Just Filtered by all integers. Increasing. Oh. In, uh, I guess I've said it, uh, you know, actually, for this, I should probably say it's an decreasing. I'm going to want to switch to thinking of it as an increasing filtration in one second, but uh, why don't I say it's an increasing filtration, and this is the minus n power of the identity count. Okay, so uh, what are some examples? Well, these, ob these generating objects that I'm calling O of n in C, the complex, the way that I want to think about that is you just take ZP, you think of it as having a, a trivial filtration where its associated graded is entirely in degree n. And you, um, or sorry, I think I'm describing O of minus n here. Well, it depends on whether it's an increasing or decreasing filtration. You take ZP, you put it in a single degree, and then you let gamma act in the way that's forced by this condition. So gamma is, uh, is this absolute the family. It is, yes. Okay, so, uh, so this category, I said I wanted it to be generated by these uh, twists. Uh, technically, the entire category of, that I've described on the right is not generated by this, but I just take the subcategory that's generated by this problem. Is it also the object A is in C? What's that? Are the object A should also be in C? Uh, you're stealing my punchline. It doesn't make sense yet to ask whether A is in C because A is a prismatic F gauge and C is a, C is this unrelated category. So those are filtered complexes, let us say, of P complete, the billion group is continuous gamma action. Yes. And the, the, co the, co and the filtration is exhaustive and com is, it self is it complete I, or is I, it completed? So or, or I don't want to demand the filtration is exhaustive. Um, it is not going to matter whether you demand that it's complete. I've got to, 
what I'm going to talk about is going to factor through the completion anyway. Okay, so, um, so let me just make an observation. So this category C, it's, it's not that complicated, but here's something that you could do to simplify even further. So there's a functor C goes to braided um, complexes, which is just, you have a filtered complex and you send it to its associated graded. Remember, everything is peak here. So, and, you know, objects of C, so here you're losing some information about the filtration by taking the associated graded. You're also forgetting the action of gamma, but not really because you know how gamma is supposed to act on the associated graded level anyway. So another claim is that this functor has a right adjoint. And that right adjoint carries ZP in degree zero to an object of C that I'm going to call A zero. And moreover, A zero by general nonsense, it acquires the structure of an algebra and graded complexes is just equivalent to um, A zero modules in C. So A0, it's some algebra in C such that the category of A0 modules is now very simple. And now I want to answer Jumbo Deep's question. This is what is the what's right. that? This is the, the right hand side does not have gamma actions. The right hand side does not have gamma action. That's right. So just it's a very simple category. Uh, well, but maybe I should say a word about. So C, we're talking about ZP, complexes of ZP modules with a gamma action. At the associated graded level, we're seeing a gamma acts by characters. The characters, if we were working rationally, that should split the filtration, right? So, you know, everything is P complete, but um, you should imagine rationally C is just the category of graded things. And so this object A0, it's something that includes all of the denominators, like the most efficient denominators that you need in order to split the filtration. Like if the filtration only had five steps, you wouldn't need to work rationally. You would just need a couple of denominators. And that's kind of what A0 does. And now let me just make another unjustified claim. So there's a functor. Um, C to the category of prismatic F gauges. Um, so this functor, it carries these objects O of N to the objects that have the same name on the other side. And on X groups, they're the obvious thing. The X groups on the left-hand side have to do with the cohomology of gamma. On the right-hand side, they have to do with the cohomology of the entire Galois group. And you just, the map is just induced by the cyclotomic character. And furthermore, A0 goes to the algebra A that we're interested in. And the reason that I want a claim like this is because now I've located A0 inside a category that I can really completely understand, right? Here's, here's what C is. A0 is just some object in that category. And the theorem that we were trying to prove was a theorem about how different that object is from the unit object. You know, well, we wanted to prove it over here in the world of uh, prismatic F gauges, but you can already ask that question and answer it in the category C. So let me just tell you what C is. So C, sorry, what the algebra A0, it's an object of C. So I'm going to describe it. Um, the filtered complex, so why don't I tell you what the underlying complex is. It's QP, but where I declare that fill N of A0 is actually um, 
this thing that I mentioned earlier as the denominator that I need. I write down a filtration of QP where um, this is a P complete object in the filter derived category in the sense that each fill N is P complete. When you take the direct limit, it's no longer P complete, of course, unless you P complete it. Um, but uh, the way to think about this is I want to give QP the trivial gamma action, but I don't want to put it in degree zero. I want to put it, I want to make the filtration as least efficient as possible, subject to the constraint that gamma has to act by the nth power of the identity character on GER n. So GER zero is allowed to be ZP with the trivial gamma action. Uh, sorry, that's fill zero. Now, fill one is going to be something bigger than ZP, but we know that it can't be too much bigger because on fill one mod fill zero, the trivial action, which is the action that I'm giving this, has to coincide with the first power of the identity character, which means that you're not allowed to be any bigger than one over P times ZP. And so on and so forth. When you get to stage N, if N is divisible by large powers of P, you're allowed to make bigger jumps. Um, so this claim about the structure of A0 is something that you can just verify. It's a linear algebra exercise, uh, given what I sort of told you about this. And the fact that A0, well, I've exhibited it as a, something which has a filtration of the kind that I said A had earlier in the world of prismatic F gauges. All right, I've gone way over time. I apologize. Thank you. Other questions for Jacob? You said that A is a, one should think of A as kind of periodic motif. Yeah. So, as periodic motifs associated with schemes. Yeah, so if you think of prismatic F gauges is like some version of crystalline Galois representations. So you should think of A, the underlying Galois representation is like QP with the trivial action, but now Gal crystalline in this context is not a condition, it's a structure. But I'm going to make it crystalline in an interesting way by um, you know, doing something like this. Yeah, but it doesn't come from a scheme over. Oh, oh, sorry, you're asking. Well, it's, it's pretty big. Um, yeah, I, well. It comes from something geometric that lives over. Sorry, here's another. This is going to reiterate the original definition of A, but here's the picture. Um, so there's ZP zeta P sin, where this is, object has to do with computing symptomic cohomology. Now, what I called split symptomic cohomology was an inverse limit of five other things. And each of those has a stack associated to it. So one of those was FP sin. One of those, that, that was one corner of the square. The other one was A1 mod GM over the ring ZP zeta P. That was the bottom left corner of the square. Now in the original square, there was both ZP zeta P, which was recording Durham cohomology without its Hodge filtration. Um, I want to put that up here. Which maps to both of these. Another thing we could do is record mod P Durham cohomology with its Hodge filtration, A1 mod GM over FP. And inside everything, we have spec FP, which is recording mod P Durham cohomology without its Hodge filtration. So here's some commutative diagram of stacks, all of which map to this. And A morally is, well, it's the direct image of the structure sheaf of the co-limit of this diagram. Now it's, this part is kind of coming from the motive of spec FP. I don't know what you want to say about the rest. Why is there a morally in that state? 
Well, this part is coming. This part is the motive of spec editing. Yeah. yeah it is a structure to the co limit. Well, the co limit as a what? Uh, just push forward from each term separately and then take a look. Then it's literally true. Okay. So can I ask my question? Yeah. What is the uh, link be between this and the far content curves? Well, if, is can, it, if there is one. So inside here, oh. no, we remove the people in the unity. So there's ZP sin, and it contains this object ZP prism, which is an open substack. And morally, you can think about this as um, you know, the Farc Fantine curve depends on a choice of perfectoid thing and characteristic P. So first you're doing some absolute version where you're not um, making that choice. Well, so I mean the Farc Fantine curve, you take something like spoof A N. You remove something, and then you mod out by some action uh, Z. So what this object is like is you took spoof A and you didn't remove this thing. You didn't mod out by the Frobenius, but you did some deperfected version of that, and you took an inverse limit over all rings, right? Like this is kind of, you're, you're talking here about a specific perfect prism. And this is like something that's given as a co-limit over all prisms, not necessarily perfect. Um, now, as a replacement for modding out by the action of Z, this thing has an, an endomorphism called the Frobenius. But in this context, because you remove these things, this is a free action and it makes sense to form the quotient. Here, this is very much not a free action. It's, you know, the underlying topological place is just one point. So, um, you don't want to form the quotient except in the sense of considering things that are sort of Frobenius equivariant sheaves. And then this enlargement is, has to do with saying the same kind of things, but what you're trying to capture is not like vector bundles on the Fart Fontaine curve, but modifications of vector bundles on the Fart Fontaine curve. Yeah. Uh, so this ZP is a P, it's a cross action. Yes. And presumably your, your object A0 is FP cross equivalent. Yeah. And the action under I is the separate. So this way I can get back some statement over ZP in particular. What's that? Oh, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm asking whether you can get this report. Yeah, I think if you follow the lines that you're thinking of, you will not prove the more refined I will statement. not. Yeah. Ah. You, I mean, you will be able to reformulate the statement as a statement about certain isotypics um, for the action of FP star having certain good properties, and it will be not obvious that they have those good properties. Uh, ask me afterwards. Okay. Yeah, I think we should save any further questions for the coffee break. Let's thank Jacob again. <laughs>